uh, Her Excellency Miss uh, Maria uh, <clears throat> Basols Delgado is the Deputy Permanent Representative of Spain to the United Nations. Uh, she graduated in law and business sciences from ICADE and entered her diplomatic career in 1985. Uh, she has been assigned to the Spanish diplomatic representations in Poland and the United States. She was an advisory member in the cabinet of the Secretary of State for International Cooperation and for Ibero-America Deputy Director General of Multilateral Economic Relations and Air Maritime and Land Cooperation. Uh, she was a head of technical cabinet of the Secretary General for Foreign Affairs and Deputy Director General in the General Inspection of Services. <clears throat> in August 2007, she was the ambassador in the Special Mission for Humanitarian and Social Affairs. And from January 2009 to March 2011, she was an ambassador in the Special Mission for Migratory Affairs. Uh, ambassador Delgado, uh, we welcome you to uh, this open lecture at the GPOTS Fellowship. And today we're gonna to be talking about uh, humanitarian action, peacekeeping and sustainability. And we are looking forward to hearing from you. And again, a big thank you for taking out the time for us. Thank you, Arpit, and, and thank you for having me. Uh, it's, uh, it's funny how uh, coming to this uh, place where I am in New York and the new responsibilities gives you a, a bird eye view of everything that's happening in the world. Uh, my my uh, lecture today, if you can call it that, uh, is going to be divided into three sort of blocks. The first one, I want to talk to all of you on multilateralism. Uh, and the second, the second one will deal with peacekeeping. And finally, I will go into human rights. So um, there's no PowerPoint, no time for me to do a PowerPoint. Uh, but I hope that what uh, the, the reflections I make uh, give you a little bit of a taste of how we see the world sitting here in New York and every day uh, with our fellow uh, diplomats, uh, 192 other countries that are here with us. So let me start with multilateralism. Look, I'm going to say something that's very obvious, but I think we need to say it. Um, we live in a multipolar world, uh, a world where sovereign countries face, all of us face similar challenges, global challenges, where many of us have to suffer the global asserti assertiveness of a few countries uh, and must accommodate all of us uh, to our own very often very complex realities. Finally, uh, we all have to live with the inescapable reality that none of these global challenges that we face can be solved individually. Furthermore, we live in an interconnected multipolar world of global challenges and aspirations, as well as conflicts. We live in a world where we have new and protracted conflicts, national and regional conflicts, and all of them, and many of them, have ripple effects across the globe and are a menace to peace and security. None of these conflicts will find adequate and most importantly, lasting solutions away from the negotiating tables, away from diplomacy. Most of these diplomatic efforts will be carried out in a multilateral for fora. So some in this, in this setting, some say multilateralism is in crisis. I say, let's not forget what the world looked like when multilateralism was not there on a global scale. Europe knows too well how this looked like. It looked like war, incessant war, I would say, small wars between regions, medium wars between countries, bigger wars about, uh, amongst alliances, and then World War II and World War I uh, before that to really drive the message home. It also looked like stunted growth. It looked like lack of progress. It looked like lack of trust. We learned multilateralism and cooperation the hard way. A part of Europe uh, set out to, in a new path, in a new path to build that trust, to reconstruct economies, to ensure progress, first among 600 countries in 1957. And then slowly other countries added on to 10, 12, and 15 countries. And nowadays we are 27. A little before we started this exercise in 1948, 
United Nations drew its first breath and its, and its subsequent strength from the UN Charter. And then it, it went on to uh, agree on a Charter for Human Rights in 1948. We will be celebrating uh, its 75th anniversary next year. So if for the sake of argument, uh, multilateralism were in crisis, should and the question is, should international organizations disappear in favor of national sovereign states acting alone or on a me first basis, basically looking after their own interests in the uh, 21st century? In my view, there is no viable alternative to multilateralism. What we need to do and what we must do is demonstrate that we can reform and that we can adapt international institutions or organizations as needed. And some that we can make them fit to tackle the problems as we see them and as they come and to resolve them through international cooperation and dialogue. Now, we sometimes we forget that international organizations such as the UN are not extraterrestrial entities. They are the brain children of member states of us we created them with a vision. Much of the vision is to facilitate the exchanges, to debate, to dialogue, to resolve issues through negotiation, and if possible, by consensus, because agreements by consensus ensure always a peaceful, uh, a peaceful way forward and frequently benefit for all, uh, benefits for all signatories. Member states can and should reform inter intergovernmental uh, organizations, in international organizations, to ensure that tangible and measurable results are there and that we are the ones, and so we are the ones that have to be up to the task. Multilateralism matters because multilateralism works. And sometimes we have a tendency to forget, especially here at the UN, where we are very critical of things that don't work, uh, how the many things that have been done in the past 75 years, decolonization, an end to apartheid, human right treaties, international humanitarian law, principles and values and rights that we have incorporated into our own national, uh, national norms and constitutions, conflict prevention measures, confidence, confidence building measures, uh, you know, and then long, et cetera. We only need to look at the 2030 agenda, and, and I'll talk about that agenda a little bit later, uh, to see what we have been capable of doing. And diplomacy, in all its variations, economic diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, climate diplomacy, security diplomacy, geopolitical diplomacy, has been and still is the greatest toolkit we have at our disposal. Now, what I've seen during these past four years here is that in some places of the world, individuals question the capacity of international organizations such as the UN to solve what they consider to be their real problems and what most certainly are their real problems. The need to put food on the table, to educate their children, to drink clean, uh, water, to access jobs and have a future in the labor market, to put a roof over their heads, to access treatments for their treatment for the sick, to survive and endure floods, floods, desertification, rising temperatures. These, these are the real problems which uh, COVID-19 has, in our view, significantly, significantly exacerbated. Extreme poverty after COVID-19 is back to levels we have never seen before in our generation. 700 million people suffer extreme poverty, which means they live under $1.9 a day. And COVID-19, we foresee, will, for, will condemn another 70 million into this terrible reality. So sadly, this inequality gap is uh, widening and uh, especially is, and hits especially uh, the low income countries and the most vulnerable countries. So 
these people that question the UN and similar international organizations, uh, you know, they ask themselves, why worry about COVID-19 when we are on the border of dying hungry? Uh, when, when you don't have everything you need to make and means, why worry about world peace? when things can always get worse and what and they do and they do and very frequently they do when conflict knocks at your door and upends your world forever forcing you to flee never to return to your village to your town to your friends to your family you know the rest doesn't really matter forced displacement and i was looking at these at this uh these numbers over the weekend is an everyday reality which will reach, if we are not careful, uh, over 80 million people's, people in 2021. So th the UN, in my view, and us, the member states who work in, uh, in, here uh, at the UN, must face up to these doubts and they must treat them as an opportunity. I would even say as an obligation to do a better job to redouble the effort. And here's some of the things that I was thinking over the weekend that we need to concentrate and we actually concentrate on. First, making the UN fit for purpose through innovation, through innovation. Not only innovation through technology, but also, also through innovative programs, innovative methods of delivery of those programs, um, inno a, a reaching out to all the people to offer multifaceted solutions. This is not, we can't think that one solution will fit everybody. Innovation also in higher degrees of accountability, of transparency, of efficiency of what we do. Second, build new partnerships. Yes, international organizations are usually intergovernmental organizations, but the challenges we all face are neither simple, nor necessarily solvable by states alone. And, and so we must bring in, in numerous areas, non-state actors that actually have, have nowadays very relevant roles in those areas. Solutions that work and withstand the test of time require strong partnerships that have to include civil society, NGOs, enterprises, businesses, youth. Youth is now being included almost everywhere. Women, the other half of the world population, and not just governments. Uh, and I would even say think tanks and academia. I would add that uh, on. And third, communicate better with the general public. You know, the European Union, which has undergone Brexit, uh, has very wisely uh, planned to reinforce this area and is very, very near to opening up to the public a two year grass, uh, grassroots debate on the future of Europe. Uh, and this program will allow all citizens to express their views during their time period, this time period, two years. And as a result, we will need to build into the future work uh, of both the European Parliament, the Commission and the Council of the European Union, what that input, that very rich input that we will be getting. So uh, international organizations need to do better. And they need to disseminate not only information on disasters, but also success stories, where what we did was well done and where uh, hunger and mal malnutrition have given way to small patches of land, tended by rural families, where energy has stopped depending on chance and is guaranteed by so solar panels, where education and health uh, care reaches, finally reaches rural and urban areas uh, in a higher percentage, the success stories. So there's really no alternative in my view to multilateralism because as our Spanish, at that time, Spanish uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and nowadays High Representative and Vice President of the European Union, Mr. Josep Borrell, wrote, he wrote in an op-ed back in December 2018, and I quote, global problems cannot be managed 
from the standpoint of local myopia. So this is uh, what my thoughts are on multilateralism. Now let me, let, and diplomacy. Let me now uh, turn to, to conflicts and, and peacekeeping. As I said in my, in, at the beginning, the, the, 11, the uh, 21st century uh, continues to serve us with what we call here at the UN traditional protracted conflicts, Syria, Yemen, Middle East peace process, etc., but also with newer conflict uh, and more complex conflicts. The growing geopolitical uh, rift between major and the dysfunctions in their relationship often, often trigger and prolong these conflicts. So last year, uh, while we were at the very beginning of the pandemic, as we uh, stopped coming to meetings uh, here at the UN, uh, the UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, called for a global ceasefire. And actually a partial response came uh, and materialized in Libya, in the Ukraine, in Syria, Sudan, et cetera. Uh, but fighting has still continued in other places and has even picked up now in 2021 and new conflicts have appeared. Um, the root ca causes of these conflicts are not new. They're legion and very diverse. In, in general, it's about the economy, cultural differences, land disputes, but more and more in the past decades, it has also been about raging climate change, about water disputes, about a collapsing biodiversity, about xenophobia, about ethnic rivalry, about terrorism and nuclear proliferation, just to mention a few. And I would like to stop just for a minute on one of these root uh, causes climate change and environmental degradation. I call it the great leveler because this, this, this root cause knows no borders, no boundaries and no beliefs. And it affects us all. And for some countries, the small island developing countries, this is an existential threat. And they say this very often here at the UN when they take the floor. Numerous conflicts have been linked to exploitation of natural resources, timber, gold, oil, um, diamonds, minerals, rare minerals. They're all at the heart of this. I looked at the la latest United Nations Environmental Program report. It's called Making Peace with Nature. And it's a, it's a report that one needs to read. And in that report, it said that 2,500 conflicts were linked to fossil fuels, water, food, and land, and are currently occurring across the planet. It's a very big number land degradation, water crisis, water scarcity, all of these put together cause environmental migration for many, many people. Uh, in other parts of the world, they are, people are, are, are uh, experiencing threats and expulsions from their land just to have those lands free for mining, uh, for industrial logging, for exports, etc. So if the UN was and it was built to ensure and sustain peace. Um, you know, when you looked, uh, when you look at the UN Charter, all these uh, root causes are, are not there. Not even the, the, the there, there's not even a mention to peacekeeping in the UN Charter. So the UN Charter really does not offer any guidance as to this form of collective action. The UN peacekeeping history, and I was going through it over the weekend is full of lights and full of shadows. It's some success and many failures uh, as it sought to provide security and peace all over the world. Dag Hammarskjöld, whom you I'm sure remember, he was one of the first secretary generals of this uh, institution, uh, was probably the secretary general that dared to fill better the gap between the charter and traditional diplomacy and did a lot of shuttle diplomacy back and forth. In fact, he, he died doing uh, shuttle dip diplomacy in the 60s. This role after Dag uh, passed away was very much cur curtailed uh, during the Cold War. I mean, uh, the two major powers were the ones to decide in reality about war. Uh, but uh, subsequent um, secretary generals uh, without wanting to play politics, 
played an important role in settling disputes. And they armed themselves with special envoys and special representatives to help, help them do this. And actually we have an enormous number of special envoys and special representatives of the Secretary General uh, doing this uh, job all over the world. Now, peacekeeping, peace enforcement, and peace building are, are what I call the three sides of a 3D coin. Uh, it's a very thin borderline that uh, you know, divides peacekeeping from peace enforcement. Uh, it is very difficult objectively to keep to impartiality and neutrality and the soft stance that characterizes peacekeeping uh, when peacekeeping troops themselves are being targeted and attacked. So um, sustaining peace nowadays uh, involves more than ever the need to act in three uh, stages of the conflict, pre-conflict, during conflict, and post-conflict. Preventive diplomacy, pre-conflict diplomacy is crucial. And it is at the center of what Secretary General Guterres uh, has um, developed as his broad vision for this agenda. One of the first deployment uh, of peacekeeping forces as a preventive measure was UNPREPDEP, uh, a peacekeeping operation that's almost lost in time in, the in 1995, uh, when uh, peacekeeping forces were deployed uh, with the task to patrolling, of patrolling Macedonia's border with Serbia. So conflict pr prevention uh, has been used in the past and continues to be used, uh, but it entails a very big capacity to recognize, analyze, and deal with ro the root causes. This is why it's preventive diplomacy. Uh, just the other day, I was looking at the news and OCHA, as you know, the humanitarian uh, agency of the United Nations, expressed its concern publicly for new and catastrophic drought and water shortages in Somalia, a country where tensions are already high due to a political crisis at the end of the uh, present president's uh, mandate, and also at the, because of lacked program general elections. But furthermore, tensions have kept rising in this country because of the attacks of terrorist group Al-Shabaab near the capital. So there you have a triple a situation where triple forces, the drought, the water shortages, and the political forces, and the terrorist forces uh, are, you know, sort of making up a perfect, a perfect storm. Conflict prevention also entails the capacity to mediate, to negotiate. And this is something that I wanted to say very clearly. Conflict resolution requires political solutions. And political solutions are a very comprehensive process in which diplomacy really plays a, a pivotal role because sustainable peace, and I want to underline sustainable peace, cannot be achieved unless all parties agree and unless all agreements are rooted in national and regional partnerships. And there's one more ingredient that I want to add on to this equation. A peace, peace and post-conflict rebuilding cannot take hold and will not take hold if one half of the population of any given country is not sitting at the table. If women are not seated at the negotiating table and are not accorded uh, a say in those peace agreements. UN mission mandates for peacekeeping and for political missions are important. They should be well-crafted. They should have clarity in the mandates. They should consider, consider what we do in the short term, yes, but also medium and long-term. And they should also consider a way out after peace is there and post uh, and peace building has begun, how to bring back the keys, peacekeeping forces. We have many peacekeeping operations uh, right now. Uh, I think the total was 14 uh, peacekeeping operations active today. But we must remember that they're not an end in itself. They are a means to an end. 
and the, there is a cycle to promote and a cycle after peacekeeping has reached a positive conclusion to promote peace building and post-conflict reconstruction that is already a very important part of what needs to be done. Two more words about peacekeeping because I think that uh, I want to, to share with you a, a very recent action that uh, Guterres has, uh, has put on the table for, uh, and that all member states have agreed to by consensus. Um, the Secretary General Guterres uh, went public last year uh, with a document called Action for Peacekeeping. It's a declaration, we all signed it, and it's a commitment to, uh, based on his vision, to deliver uh, a management reform destined to make uh, peacekeeping uh, better and more efficient. Um, this action for peacekeeping uh, is still going on and valid today. He put it on the table three years ago. But in order to reinforce this document, uh, Guterres just a few days ago um, reinforced it by, um, with a new document, a, a, a Action for Peace Building Plus. Uh, it, was, it happened last March. And there, the two main ideas that I wanted to underline was that he found, that Guterres found a need to again reinforce the primacy of politics for the resolution of, con on, of conflicts and the search for durable solutions that are needed to sustain peace. And the second idea that he, fought, he thought he needed to reinforce was the need for the UN troops to, to perform better on the ground uh, and, and for us member states to provide them better, for, to have them better equipped, better trained, uh, to ensure less loss of life. So um, these are some of the ideas uh, that I uh, thought about this weekend when thinking about peacekeeping. Now, turning finally to human rights, um, human rights are at the very core of the values and principles that we believe in and that we seek to protect uh, through preventive political dialogue, through peacekeeping operations themselves, and, and most assuredly through post-conflict rebuilding uh, of countries that have been in conflict. 75 years ago, the charter, the UN charter uh, reaffirmed, and I quote, its faith in fundamental rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women. And three years later in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights defined those rights more fully. Uh, over the ensuing decades up until today, massive gains have been made in, in human rights. Uh, and the Secretary General very recently, and I was sitting at the, uh, at the General Assembly Hall when he, when he said this, recalled that billions of people live safer, longer, and more dignified lives today. We have covenants spelling out the full range of civil, political, social, economic, cultural rights. There is nowadays a robust treaty-based system in work and an institutional architecture for the promotion and protection of, of, of human rights. And the result has been a common vision by all nations as, and, and, a, and a set of rights that uh, are now are, are at once at, in the same uh, uh, vision, universal and indivisible. So why talk about human rights when if, if the story is so successful? We need to talk about human rights and still have them every day here in our work uh, at, the, at the core of what we do, because human rights continue to face major sh challenges. And no country is immune to this. Uh, there's no need to pinpoint countries because there's always better to do in each of our countries, including mine, Spain. Sp uh, human rights have been steadily facing pressures, and I would even say rising pressure, pressures, before the, the pandemic. Uh, and they continue to do so 
uh, now during the pandemic even more so, and will continue to do so in the, in, in the next years. I mean, during the pandemic and before the pandemic, the rule of law has, and it continues to be challenged. There are repressive political systems that infringe on basic freedoms on basic rights. There's little accountability for atrocity crimes, women, girls, minorities, LGTB, LGTBI people are confronted with chronic discrimination and violence, racism and xenophobia are on the rise and a very long, et cetera. Guterres, uh, the past uh, two weeks when I was at the General Hall Assembly, underlined that COVID has even triggered another human rights crisis of its own, the limitation of civic space and work of journalists and human rights defenders. He further pointed out that in his view, the greatest human rights challenge during COVID has been gender, gender equality, gender-based violence at home, gender uh, job losses, women jo lost more jobs than men, child marriage has gone up, sexual exploitation has gone up, the loss of education for many women and many girls who had no access to internet. So, you know, with COVID, we've seen areas that we thought were a little bit more controlled uh, and, and well, uh, you know, and, and, and well into being resolved, uh, slip back. This is why uh, the uh, Secretary General, February 2020, made a call to action on human rights. And, and he delivered this call to action and renewed it uh, two weeks ago in March. Uh, and he clearly stated the need to renew the first bond derived from the Charter of Human Rights, from that charter that we all approved in 1948. Uh, so as we continue to fight to attain all civil, political, economic, social, cultural rights, several areas continue to warrant an extra effort. Now, when the Secretary General um, set out uh, in this call to action, he, the, the most recent one, when he again went back to the call to action that he delivered last year and renewed it uh, two or three weeks ago, uh, he reflected on what were the difficulties and what are the difficulties, but he set out 11 principles, I'm not going to go through them, um, that I thought were very important to guide our way forward. And out of those 11 principles, I'd like to stop just very briefly on four. First, he, dis he underlined quite a number of times that human rights are universal and indivisible. Why? Because human rights are, su are being subjected nowadays to three things, alternative narratives, some have said there's a difference between the right to development and the civil and political uh, human rights and the defense of the primacy of relations between states versus those who place the person in the center of human rights. Two, they're being subjected to alternative concepts. So we find that concepts that were never in, this, in the Charter of Human Rights are slowly creeping into uh, the human rights arena. For example, mutually beneficial cooperation. That's a new concept. And three, they're being subjected to a sort of hierarchy. So during uh, the uh, Trump administration in the US, the commission of inalienable rights was created. Now it has been uh, canceled. Uh, and this meant that some rights were inalienable and some rights were not. So there has been a push by certain countries to establish a difference inside this whole corpus of uh, human rights. One of these of those countries, uh, very uh, interestingly, established uh, the importance of finding an equilibrium between universality and specificity in human rights, and uh, and went on to say, some human rights, and I quote, 
some human rights such as peace, development, justice, equity, democracy, and freedom are common values for all humanity. And some human rights uh, are, are specific because, and I quote, countries differ in their history, culture, social systems, level of social and, uh, and uh, economic development, uh, which calls for protection of human rights informed by national reality of each country and the needs of its population. These quotes come from uh, Minister Wang Yi himself, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of China, uh, in a session of the Council of Human Rights in February 2021 in Geneva. And a further quote uh, also illustrates what I'm trying to convey. Uh, and the quote goes like this, uh, open quotation marks, um, human rights are not the monopoly of a small number of countries, and in any case, should not be used as a tool to pressure other countries and intervene in matters related to the domestic jurisdiction of states. So this is the uh, this is what we're dealing with here uh, that undermines the universality and indivisibility of human rights as the charter intended. And the, the, the other three principles very, very graphic, you know, very telegraphically are that I thought uh, the Guterres underline and are interesting because it conveys where uh, what are his concerns are the following. Human diversity is an asset. He thought he needed to say that. Human diversity is an asset, an asset and not a threat. Two, climate change is the biggest threat uh, to our survival as a species. And three, human rights are anchored in national ownership, yes, but linked globally. They require broad and sustained engagement within states, civil society, and other stakeholders. So he, need, he, need, he thought he needed to say that, and this gives you a taste of where the problems lie and the work we need to do moving forward. Just one last, very last uh, point about uh, Agenda 2030. I told you at the beginning I would refer to it, and I want to refer to it because Agenda 2030, that is, is, a, is a document, we, all member states, 193 member states, passed and approved by consensus in 2015. And it has 17 sustainable development goals, 169 targets, and more than 5,350 uh, 5, actions. And they all concern, you know, deal with human rights, sustainable development, conflict, conflict prevention, etc. In in sum, it's our blueprint for the next decade, and and this uh, agenda, uh, which is an agenda for all countries, Spain has its own national plan to develop this agenda at home. This agenda concerns all of us. Because if we manage by 2030, and we're late already doing that, if we manage by uh, 2030 to really push forward in this agenda and all 17 of its development goals, the world would be transformed, completely transformed. And, and I think that we uh, were on track, not as much as we wanted to before COVID-19. Now we're not on track. Now COVID-19 has raised the bar and we need to accelerate very, very uh, much in order to, to complete uh, the agenda by 2030. I don't know if I had time, Arpit, to just touch on two things, uh, COVID-19. Do I have time? Certainly, certainly. Uh, we, we do have a number of questions lined up, but then I will cut down on my questions. Uh, but okay. I, I have at least one that I need to ask you after this. But yeah. Okay. So um, COVID-19 um, has stalled progress everywhere. Uh, we're not on track, as I said, as we were uh, before 2020. Uh, and it has added to a list of problems that I have pointed very, very, you know, very, um, uh, succinctly, uh, but 
it has added three problems that I wanted to, to put on the table. One, the need to end the pandemic through access to vaccines. It is very clear to us that equitable, efficient, and transparent access to vaccines, medical treatments, and therapeutics is a must. And it's a priority not only for the UN and WHO, but also for us uh, countries, both developed countries and non-developed countries. We need to ramp up production. We need to reach an agreement to voluntarily and temporarily uh, put on hold intellectual property rights to the vaccine and make it available for production in other countries, etc. So this is one of the problems that we're dealing with here and in Geneva quite frequently. And actually, uh, it consumes, you would not believe it, it consumes a lot of our time and not in a lot of our meetings. Second, the economic problems. I mean, COVID-19, if, if there were economic problems before, COVID-19 has really uh, exacerbated those problems. And we now find ourselves with six countries in default. We find ourselves with uh, countries that are unable to pay their debt interest due to economies that have either slowed down or completely stalled. Um, there are significant liquidity problems in, in many economies. Uh, borrowing costs have gone up. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very dire uh, panorama out there. So some form of relief has already come. Debt moratoria and standstill agreements are there. Uh, the debt service suspension initiative, which, was, uh, which began in 2020, has been extended to the end of 2021. And my bet is that it's going to be extended to 2022. Uh, the IMF, after an enormous amount of discussions, has finally approved the transfer of $600 billion in special drawing rights to most vulnerable countries. And, but not to say, not, that doesn't mean that a new emission of special drawing rights is not needed and experts are looking at that. Um, but there's still lack of access to liquidity programs to facilitate market functioning. And uh, many, many are, adv are advocating for just outright debt cancellation uh, in order for low income countries and very vulnerable countries to be able to, um, you know, stand a little bit better on their own two feet uh, while they wait for uh, their usual uh, uh, money producing activities, tourism, commerce to come back. And finally, the last, the last, uh, uh, issue I wanted to mention is climate change. I haven't talked in depth about that, but we need to be more ambitious. We need to be very much more ambitious before yeah. the COP26 in Glasgow uh, starts next November. And this is what we're trying to do um, locally in, in my country. Uh, but um, there are other countries also uh, that, that need to uh, shoulder that weight and and come back and um, come back go to Glasgow with ambitious programs to reduce emissions and I'll leave it at that and uh, start with your question if you want Arpit. Uh, thank you thank you so much uh, Maria if I may and uh, you know my question is actually uh, regarding climate change and that's uh, you know that also gives us some time to talk a lot more about the subject but before I jump in the question, I have to uh, just say thank you and compliment you for one bit because this question comes up all the time. Uh, the you know uh, seemingly great debate about whether multilateral institutions uh, are of any good or uh, have they been uh, you know utterly uh, useless. And uh, thank you for uh, you know bringing in a balanced and reasoned perspective over here where you say that you know when you look at certain things about you know peacekeeping human rights we have done a lot better than you know uh, what history has shown us before these multilateral institutions existed essentially as you said that europe had been in a perpetual state of war before that uh, and so were many other parts of the world uh, but at the same time you also admitted to the fact that there is uh, indeed a lot more innovation and reform needed and uh, that is uh, perhaps the uh, you know 
most balanced and close to reality view that I've heard on this topic. So thank you uh, so much for that. Uh, my question to you is, uh, you know, regarding desertification and, you know, uh, we know that as early as 1977 at the UN conference on desertification held in Nairobi, uh, <clears throat> we had maps of deserts uh, that were uh, drawn for, uh, you know, all across the world. And Spain was the only Western European country uh, that was included with a very high desertification rate in the entire uh, you know, uh, European continent, especially the southeast of the peninsula. And since then, Spain has contributed immensely in uh, you know, countering de desertification in Nigeria, Sudan, China, India, uh, Iran, and Mongolia. Now, my question is that, again, uh, this is a sustainable development of climate change issue. De desertification eventually turns into a human rights issue because of lack of food lack of water and essential human services. Now, what in your view uh, are some of the you know, uh, things that the world should be doing or the world should be coming together on? Uh, and what, what do you think are some of the uh, you know, uh, best practices or recommendations or steps forward that we should take to solve this problem of desertification, which is a climate change as well as a human rights problem? And Thank big countries are big countries with big populations are suffering with this. Yes, they are. Uh, thank you very much for the question. It's a it's a it's a very interesting question. It's a question uh, which you know in this in this mission where I'm I'm sitting, uh, we have counselors of all kinds and 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 ex ex expertise, uh, and we have a very very good counselor on environmental issues. And this, as well as everything that is being done for Glasgow, et cetera, but desertification, water, water, water problems, these are all uh, things, issues which uh, he deals with, I would say, on an everyday basis. I agree with you, and it's a very good question, is I agree with you that desertification not only has uh, immediate consequences on the land, uh, on the barrenness on the land, uh, et cetera, uh, it has very serious social and economic consequences. Um, it's, it's, it's not only, desertification is not only the result of lack of water. So let's be clear about that. It's also the result of over-exploiting water when, and not yeah. managing properly water. It's the result of unsustainable agricultural practices. It's a result of overgrazing places. It's a result of irrational urbanization. So the causes, sometimes when we think desertification, there's no water, no rain. No, there are other causes to that, so many other causes. And the UN Conference to Combat Des Desertification is one of the three big conventions uh, that resulted from the Rio Conference, um, you know, already identified that problem early on. As you say in Europe, Desertification and drought affected countries are mainly Spain, very prominently, but also Portugal. Mm -hmm. And also, also the southern areas of Greece, the southern areas of Italy, the southern areas of Cyprus, uh, the coastal, the coastal areas of Bulgaria and Romania. You know, in Spain, when we have these very hot summers, um, when I was young. Uh, my family used to say, oh, we have Kalima. And I would, you know, Kalima, Kalima, I never knew what Kalima was. Well, <laughs> Kalima was the hot, very hot wind from the, desert, the Saharan desert uh -huh. that crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and came into the south of Spain and was responsible for temperatures rising to 40 degrees Celsius um, in half of our peninsula. So yeah, we have Kalima and the winds keep on coming from, 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 from Sahel. Um, policies. I don't know, you know, I can tell you what we have done yeah. to try to, to stop this phenomenon. Uh, what we have done, and, and we have a long tradition of doing this uh, since the 19th century, first of all, is <coughs> repopulate forests, plant trees. The more trees you plant, the, the, the uh, less desertification 
you may get and 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 not only repopulate forest but also repopulate them with the kind of trees that are going to be staying and that do not contribute to the soil degra degradation one of the uh, trees that we have repopulated part of spain with are eucalyptus trees why mm -hmm. uh, up in the north why because those trees produced what was needed for chemical in for the chemical industry near uh, Asturias in, in Santander. But those are, are trees that contribute to soil degradation. So repopulate with the correct trees. Yeah. Then we have a, a very good pro, uh, project, and I was looking this up, uh, against desertification in the Mediterranean. So, you know, in the coastal areas. And it incorporates not only the concept of, of, of desertification, but what we, we all always, but what we've done through this project is a map of degraded land due to desertification. And so once you have the map, you have the possibility, once you have the data, which is crucial, you have the possibility to put in the policies, to insert the policies that are needed in each area and build the institutions that are going to manage and oversee those policies. So we're, you know, this is not magic. This is a For lot that of work context. Yeah. In that yeah. context. And, and that is a lot of work. We've also adopted a, a national plan against desertification. And this plan, uh, this plan, you know, looks at prevention, mitigation, sustainable development, et cetera, et cetera. And the last thing we've done, last April 8th, so last week, we passed the law on climate change and energy, which is part of our contribution to COP26. This is part of what we're doing to eliminate climate change adverse effects. And this law, as well as the plan on adaptation to climate change, have a very big, are very concentrated also on this desertification issue. So in short, if I had to sum up a recipe, uh, it would be, A, get your data, get your data, get your information, map out the area uh, or the country, what's happening where. Two, uh, you know, look at the UN conventions and see what they're doing, but also look at what we're trying to do in climate change and apply the policies that are needed once you have the information. Forest trees, more trees, uh, better management of, of water, uh, whatever those waterways are, um, and not one size fits, fits all policy. You need to differentiate uh, what you do in one part of your country and what you do in another part of your country, because you know desertification in our country has been hovering over the south of Spain since the Romans. I mean, years ago, yeah. and we. If you go, you know, Romans were so, and I'll stop there because I can keep on going, but <laughs> Romans were so intelligent that they built aqueducts and aqueducts were not mm -hmm. just a haphazard invention. They were an invention that carried water from point A to point B when plastics were not there and hoses were not there because yep. Yep. they saw the need for that. And, and manage irrigation, manage agriculture. Those are, those are um, you know, no brainers when you try to tackle desertification. Certainly. Uh, thank you so much for this very detailed response. And uh, we have uh, probably uh, just eight minutes and uh, time to uh, maybe squeeze in two more questions. And uh, one is coming from one of our fellows and one is coming from uh, one of our team members. So. Uh, uh, KP, would you uh, quickly want to ask your question? And then uh, after that, it will be followed by a question from Dhriti. Yes. Uh, good morning, Your Excellency. Thank you so much for such an insightful and informative session. And I especially agree with the fact that we need to be more ambitious when it comes to our climate targets. Uh, and in furtherance of that, so my question is with respect to uh, your opinion on uh, the scope for cooperation between uh, India and Spain at a bilateral level and bilateral agreements in general in addition to uh, what is envisioned by multilateral agreements such as the Paris Agreement or even uh, agreements with the EU. And I was just, uh, I just wanted to know your opinion on uh, the scope of bilateral trade agreements in uh, 
with respect to climate change and energy specifically between India and Spain? Okay, that's really a good question, a very specific question. Huh? Um, I've lived in India, though I wasn't, uh, I wasn't working. Um, I, I, I married my husband who was ambassador to India. And so I went there and I had the luxury of, uh, of um, living and, there and, and seeing the country during four years and a half. A great country, I had a great time there, um, but a very diverse country. And I always thought that India was more a continent than a country uh, because when you travel through that country, you see, you see what you see when you travel through Europe. No? Uh, in climate change, I think that, uh, that India is doing very well uh, from, what I've, uh, from what has been, I've been told doing very well and is very ambitious. Uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Modi is really ambitious uh, regarding climate change. But the, 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 the uh, how would I put this in, <laughs> the words come in Spanish. So excuse me for that. But India is such a big country uh, and uh, development is so different in one place and another that really to, to reduce uh, its emission um, and, to, and to be able to reach its uh, goals in climate, uh, you need a whole of country policy. Now, I think India is on track to exceeding its, its renewable targets, it's, it's, it's targets in renewable energy. And I think that is exactly what it has to do. We have been doing the same thing. We have been uh, being very ambitious in reducing uh, fossil energy uh, through renewable energy, both solar or uh, wind energy. And this is what uh, India has been doing. So we are known in Spain uh, for very good enterprises, very good businesses that have developed renewable energy alternatives. Uh, and, and one of the things that I would point to is the need to make that cooperation closer. More than agreements, I would say, put into contact the enterprises that are good at this and that have already uh, uh, a past and that already have the data and the information needed to see what worked and what did not work. That is one of the things that our uh, mission in our embassy in India and, this, and more uh, concretely, our, our commercial office in, in India is trying to do. The second thing, and, and it was, it's very funny that, that you should mention it because the second thing is, is that there is a high level dialogue going to happen on energy that's going to happen in September, 2021. And it's, it's going to be the first global gathering on energy under the auspices of the, of the General Assembly. And it's going to present a historic opportunity pre-Glasgow, pre-COP26, uh, to provide transformational action um, in, in, in support of the Paris Agreement and especially in the field of energy. And it just turns out that both India and Spain, along with another seven countries, uh, are global champions of this high level uh, uh, dialogue on energy and are going to be working together on what we call theme two. And theme two is energy transition. How do you transition from fossil to renewable? And so they're working already closely together, developing ideas, initiatives to foster renewable energy, energy efficient and, and efficiency and, and decarbonization patterns. So there's these these, uh, we, we'll see what happens in, I will be able to tell you more, we'll see what happens in September. But it's, uh, it was a good uh, thing when I saw the, the <clears throat> nine countries that are working together to see that we were both together there and we may have uh, very similar recipes to get on with this energy transition that we need to accelerate so much. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you uh, so much, uh, Your Excellency. That was really uh, amazing to hear. And I will look forward to the conversation in September. 
Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, if if we may just squeeze in one quick question, uh, the last one from uh, Dhriti. Uh, Dhriti, are you here? Would you uh, like to ask your question by unmuting yourself? All right. So in in uh, in that case, if Dhriti isn't here anymore, then Anna from uh, the audience, uh, she had a question. So. Uh, Anna, would you like to unmute yourself quickly and then ask your question, please? Um, hello, my name is Anna. I'm from Romania. Um, I have to say that, um, first of all, uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for your presence today with us here. Uh, thank you to, uh, to the organizers for the event. It, it's uh, been very helpful, very enlightening to say so. Um, and I look forward to seeing more from you guys in the future. Um, concerning the um, human rights, I, I heard a lot about them and I've, uh, I've read a lot about them, um, also written some papers on that. Uh, I, I'm very interested, uh, based on uh, this uh, whole COVID pandemics uh, situation, what exactly uh, will the UN, uh, how exactly will the UN ensure that the human rights will be respected in those areas where uh, um, they weren't uh, very much, uh, let's just say, uh, aware of them once, and then uh, they, they are, they've they been very affected by the COVID itself. They don't have access to vaccines, they don't have access to clean water, and to all the other uh, facilities that uh, we do have. Uh, and uh, a secondary question, if I may, uh, it's concerning um, uh, what exactly um, is the view over the private sector in getting involved and helping uh, the UN to uh, enforce their program and their programs for the people. And I'm not talking about the uh, think tanks or the NGOs, but I'm talking about companies from either technology in industry sectors. Um, that's it and thank you very much. Both great questions, Anna. Happy to, to be able to, to say something about uh, both of them. Look, what, what you mentioned about uh, areas that are very difficult to reach, I can't agree with you more. I mean, uh, human right protection in those areas are, is extremely difficult. I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, something that I really feel very deeply about. Um, in, in areas of conflict, in areas, in far-flung areas where access to water means two-mile walk uh, and then two-mile back to your house uh, to be able to drink water. It is very difficult to protect those human rights. And as I said in a part of my, my lecture at the beginning, uh, it, it, is incumbent about, uh, it is incumbent upon governments uh, to reach and, and their other population and ensure that human right protection. It is, for me, the, the most difficult part of this whole thing is in conflict situations, in areas that are uh, where there's a war going on, where guerrillas, where terrorism uh, are, uh, you know, are, are fighting. Uh, human right protection there is extremely difficult. And in COVID situations, it's even more difficult. So, um, my answer to you there is A, one of the most important things that Spain backs when we look at a op uh, peacekeeping operation in, for, you know, to, to maintain peace during conflicts is including in those peace, in, amongst those peacekeepers, two new um, types of experts, experts on human mm -hmm. rights and experts on climate change both of them, yes. experts on human rights, yes. because we want them to be our eyes during conflict and during the time that the peace uh, operation is functioning. Uh, experts on, on climate, because we want to uh, diminish the footprint of peacekeepers climate-wise in those countries. So that is first part of the question. Second part of the question, of the, of the answer. Second part of the answer is going to be, uh, what do we do in humanitarian situations? Very difficult. If, if OCHA, 
the humanitarian uh, agency, uh, delivering agency for the UN. If OCHA is able to access those areas, then we can be fairly sure that we are going to deliver and we're going to protect very basic human rights, the right to food, the right to health, access to health, etc. But I would say that the biggest deliverer of that kind of protection is the International Red Cross. That is the institution that has access and the access, the reputation to, to be guaranteed the access to these sort of situations, even during COVID-19. And they are the ones to be able to report back what is happening and if, if and what more is needed. Um, but, and I would like to close with this, this part of the question, let's not forget COVID-19 is in some parts of the world, the least of anybody's worries. First worry is keep your life and not be bombshelled the next day. Yep. Have access to food, have access to drinking water. That's the first order of things. When you look at the list of priorities, COVID-19 and the vaccine, way down there. Mm -hmm. So that is a big reality. Second, private uh, sector involvement. You know, the private sector is very excited to, to get involved in what we do here. There is uh, an, a, a program called the Global Compact, the United Nations mm -hmm. Global Compact, uh, with a very able director who, what does she do? In, in this, in this um, hesitate program, uh, enterprises from the whole world can sign up and, 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 and see the programs and participate. Uh, Spain has the very high honor of having the most enterprises that have signed up to the Global Compact. We have 1,500 enterprises that have signed up and are willing to not only see what the UN is doing, but also provide answers and provide their time and provide programs. So uh, my, my view on private sector, on the private, private sector involvement uh, here at the UN is not only positive, but I would say that it would be, it is our obligation, and this is my very personal view as member states, to provide them with much more guidance than we have done up until now on what we need from them. You know, because uh, private enterprises are nowadays not only are not only happy with giving money for this or that project, they want to know where that money goes for for uh, for and how better to help and have a say. And mm -hmm. in my view, we need to open up that that to them that possibility because all their opinions since they have information on the ground all over the world, is going to enrich our views and our positions and our programs. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's going to make them better. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Anna. You. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for taking out this time and for uh, this fascinating and open discussion on <clears throat> human rights, the environment, uh, international organizations. I think we've covered so much ground today that it's going to take us a while to digest all of this and probably watch this video over and over again. But uh, again, thank you for being so gracious with your time. Uh, I did not know that you have uh, lived in India. So maybe the next time uh, when COVID is over, you should visit us and give us a chance to host you uh, over here. And since you've traveled around much in India, maybe you could also show us around some place because it's such a huge country that nobody knows the whole uh, <laughs> country themselves. But uh, again, uh, we hope to stay in touch and engage with you in the future. And thank you so much once again for your time. Thank you. And let me just, uh, as I say goodbye, tell you that for me, it is always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to uh, have a dialogue uh, with uh, young, uh, the younger generations. It is my absolutely, you know, absolute view uh, that, um, if young, if the young generations are interested in these issues, we have a chance um, because the world is yours. It's not mine. I mean, I've been here working for a long time. So keep on 
keep on learning and keep on being interested in all these issues, uh, you're going to have to solve them better than we have in the future. Uh, and thank you, Arpit, for reaching out and for hosting me. It's been a pleasure and uh, have a great end of the day, night or morning. I have no idea. You're all over the world. <laughs> From all over the world right now. But you have a nice day ahead, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Have a nice day, evening or morning, wherever you are. And please do engage with us in the future. Bye-bye.